here we are still in the Easter season. And uh, I'm a little bit obsessed with uh, something at Easter. I'm going to be talking to you today about the resurrection body of Jesus Christ. And next week, I'm going to be talking to you about our resurrection. What's that going to look like? But this week, I want to talk about the resurrection of our Lord. This is important because I suspect that most Christians have an understanding of the resurrection as a resuscitation. That sometime in the wee hours of Easter Sunday morning, the body of our Lord simply came back to life. He managed to get the wrapping off of him, the the shroud. Uh, He sat up and he walked out of the tomb, uh, as we said in the country years ago, buck naked. And then where did the boy go? Uh, You can't wander the streets like that, even if you're the savior of the world. He had to go get some clothes on. Did he visit somebody? Uh, That, that I think, is the image of Christians, many, many Christians, about what happened at the time of the resurrection, that it was a resuscitation of the dead body of Jesus. Uh, Don Piper died on January the 18th, 1989. Don Piper, Baptist minister, he had been to a Baptist uh, conference somewhere in Texas, uh, down not far from Huntsville, because I think the truck that hit him was out of Huntsville, and it was uh, filled with prisoners from the prison. Hit him head on, the truck rolled right over him, and he was killed instantly. Uh, The paramedics got there pretty quickly, and they said that he's dead, and they uh, threw a tarp over his vehicle, and they couldn't find the coroner, so he was going to be there for quite a long time before they could move the body. They were stuck. While they were in this situation, um, uh, somebody who didn't even know Don, although he was a Baptist preacher and had been to the same conference, Uh, drove up and saw the scene, Don on a wrecker, and he got out and he wanted to, uh, he went over to the paramedics and asked them what the situation was, and they said, well, there's a dead man in the car. Uh, He got run over by that truck, and he said, well, I would like to uh, pray uh, for him. Uh, He said he was compelled somehow to do this. He said, I want to pray for him. Uh, Would you raise the tarp and and let me do this? I said, no, no, he's he's dead. There's nothing you can do for him. Well, he continued to persist and insist until they let him into the car. He sat in the back seat. Uh, Don uh, was in the front seat, Don Piper, and he uh, got in the car and he laid his hand on Don's shoulder. His one arm was nearly severed. There was a puncture wound in the chest. Uh, He was in a horrible shape. His leg was crushed. Uh, There was not a lot of blood because his heart had stopped immediately, had stopped stopped, uh, pumping blood. He was dead. And as Don sat in the back seat uh, as uh, uh, praying, He started singing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And Don Piper began to sing it with him. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. And the dead man began to sing, What a friend we have in Jesus. Well, he jumped out of the car, and he said, He's not dead. And they said, Of course he's dead. We checked him. And they said, no, he is not dead. He's singing, okay? And so he finally got them to check, and sure enough, he was not dead. Then, although he had been dead for 90 minutes, Don Piper wrote the book, 
90 minutes in heaven. He wasn't actually all the way into heaven. He hasn't crossed that barrier, which for him was, remember, Baptist preacher, heaven's going to give us what we expect. <laughs> it was a, a pearlescent looking gate, okay, pearly gates. He was not allowed to go beyond that. In fact, to keep him busy for those 90 minutes. Most people, when they get to get, have one of these near-death experiences, you know, they may see Granny or Uncle John, Nance Sue, or, or Mama or Papa or their dog Rover, or several people like that. He saw everyone that he had ever known and been close to who had died since he was a child. They were coming by to greet him. And he was not allowed to move forward through the gate that he could see, which for him was a gate. Other people, it might be a rock wall or it might be a river, whatever. There's the barrier if you're going to come back. Now, this tells me that God had the intention of making Don's experience a witness. But that's a whole other sermon, and that's not the point I'm making today. When he did come back into this world, he came back as himself. In fact, he was quite miserable. He was in the hospital for months. They had to put a, a stretching device on one of his legs, and he went through horrible pain to get that leg back to where it had been. It was a terrible, terrible time in his life. He was, he was resuscitated. He was Don Piper in this world again, and bless his heart, like all the rest of us, he'll live a certain length of time, and he's going to have to die again. Okay? He knows what it's like. He knows where he's going. He has a great advantage on a lot of other people, but still, he's going to have to die again. Now, that is a resuscitation, all right? And now, let's look at the appearances of our Lord to see if it's like that. This is from the Gospel of Luke. While they were still talking about this, about an event on the road to, to Emmaus, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled, frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have here. And I believe it's in the Gospel of Matthew even that he sits down and eats a piece of fish with them. In John's Gospel, Thomas places his finger in the nail wound in the side and in the hands. And there's tremendous emphasis on the physicality of the presence of the risen Christ. But there's another something going on here. Notice the title of the sermon is, let me look and see if I'm preaching the right sermon. I may have to preach something else. I may have to switch. The same but different. Same but different. It's obviously Jesus. He is the same. But there is a difference. Notice he did not knock on the door. He did not come through the wall. He simply appeared in the room. So there is something different. This is not just the resuscitated body of Jesus. This is somehow the transformed body of Jesus. Yes, you may question, how often can this one pastor repeat a sermon illustration. Something you've heard before. The answer is 236 times. 
If the story is important, I'm willing to reuse it. We're going to look again at uh, Scott and Marty. And I want you to notice something. A couple of years ago, this young man says, I was really bad off. I was on drugs, didn't care about myself or anyone around me. After I attempted to commit suicide, I went to the hospital to get my head straightened out. When I got out of the hospital, Marty was there for me from day one. He was by my side to make sure I was okay and that I stayed in the right lane. But after he died, I grieved a lot and started sliding downhill again. Now, this is a young man who is aged uh, 18, and I think uh, uh, Marty was 17 when he died. I started sliding downhill again with the drugs. But about three months later, I was lying in the dark on the couch in the living room one night. I looked at the clock and it said 2.05. All of a sudden, I saw Marty about 10 feet away from me. I could see him like it was daytime. He had a white t-shirt and blue jeans. I sat in shock as he looked at me and smiled. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> One part of me was scared, but I was so happy to see him, I stood up. Interesting, a similar reaction to the appearance of our Lord to his disciples, both fear and joy. Marty came over to me. Everything about him, around him was light, but I couldn't see where the light was coming from. He said, don't be upset, okay? I'm happy. Go on with your life. Don't keep your mind stuck on me. Just go on. When Marty was alive, he didn't smile much, but he did this time. He looked like he was more at peace with himself and happier than I'd ever seen him. I gave him a hug, and I could smell his scent and feel his body heat. It was Marty. I could even feel his breath when he was talking. It was the weirdest thing. And then he was gone. What we're talking about here is something that goes on more than you think. This comes from a book called Hello from Heaven. How many of you ever heard of it before? Well, it was a, it was a huge hit in 1995. It was a bestseller, and it's filled with stories like this. The people over there, when God thinks it's necessary and okay, they can come and comfort people here. Our Lord had another intention. His intention was to call the disciples to take the gospel to the whole world. And what is the gospel? The understanding that God loves us and God has an intention for our lives and God has forgiven us and we have a future with our Lord in heaven. That's the message he wanted them to take to the whole world. But in both instances, it's just a matter of not earthly physics, but heavenly physics. Because anyone who's over there, and certainly our blessed Lord, can appear to anyone in this world in any way they want to. And our Lord chose to appear fully, physically present, to let them know that he was fully alive. He wasn't some wispy spirit off somewhere. 
he was fully present with them. Now that's the physics of heaven. I have thought that the weirdest physics in this world, which is quantum physics, takes us right to the edge of that heavenly physics. Uh, <laughs> nobody understands quantum physics. And I think the reason, in fact, uh, uh, Mr. Feynman, who was a, a Nobel laureate physicist and an expert in quantum physics, did not, said he did not understand his own, <laughs> his own equations. He said, in fact, if you think you, or he's supposed to have said this, if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't. No one understands it. We can use it. And I think the reason we cannot understand it is because it takes us to the very edge of that infinite mystery just beyond this world, because in reality, it is all one world, where this world at some point merges with heaven. So our Lord, yes, he appeared flesh and blood, but he was, he was transformed in that moment of resurrection. He didn't walk out of the tomb. In the moment of the resurrection, by some process that you and I don't know, and if someone explained it to us, we wouldn't understand, and anyway, there's nobody in the world who would understand it either. In a moment, the body disappeared from that tomb. And he is now able to appear to us in any way he chooses. And this morning, he has not chosen to be visibly present to us, although I don't know what you may be seeing. But I want us to understand something. He is spiritually, physically with us this day, keeping that promise that where two or more of you are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of you. Yes, he may be gathered and would be gathered with people in some great cathedral somewhere with a couple of thousand people present. But he's also at St. Matthew United Methodist Church. Not just, let's just play like he's here but really here, and he's also going to be with us when we leave this place. There is something absolutely unique about the resurrection of our Lord. Unlike these two young men, unlike anything else that's ever happened in the world, and by the way, I. I heard someone say the other day, well, this one is more unique than that one. No, <laughs> if something is unique, it's the only one. And I'm going to tell you what is the only thing about Jesus Christ in all of the history of the world and all of the history of the universe as far as we know. He is the only person who, when he left, this world. He took his body with him. We are before the one who is present with us now in all of his mystery and the glory of his love. And in our best moments, we can be in awe before him and before God's love for you and me. And those. I think sometimes the worse we may feel about ourselves, the more awesome God's love for us 
must feel. Because it's not because we deserve it. It's because we belong to him. Think about it. What a marvel it is that we know God can handle anything that comes in our lives because we belong to him. May he be praised. I was riding along the other day and I was feeling a little down about something. And I just started singing this, uh, this little hymn that we're about to sing. And the longer I sang it, the better I felt. I think that God inhabits our music. Sometimes, hallelujah. Sometimes, praise the Lord. Sometimes, gently singing our hearts in one accord. 